Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you here at uh, worship here at Rocky Hollow. You know, uh, this morning I was over at Sun City. I was making an announcement, and my brain just completely froze. I forgot everything I was saying. And then in the back of my mind, I was reminded by what Ann King told me one day. She said, Daniel, we just love it when you make mistakes. So I thought, y'all must love me a lot, you know? <laughs> For our announcements, we have uh, various things upcoming. One, hopefully you've already seen it on the slide, is our Outreach Blitz. That's going to be an opportunity for us to invite our, our members, our members, our neighbors. See, there we go. There's another one, right? Uh, to invite our neighbors to our worship services, et cetera, and that's going to be targeting uh, the North Point area of Sun City. If you'd like to participate in that, that is online. We're going to start with a breakfast, but if you'd like to eat breakfast, we ask that you to register so that we know how many people are coming and be prepared. Uh, so that would be an opportunity for us to get to know people and give them a personal invite to Easter. And then coming up for Good Friday, we're going to have in the morning Stations of the Cross at Sun City from 9 to 12. And then later that afternoon, evening, we're going to have a tenebrae. And just a short summary of tenebrae, tenebrae is basically observing the moment where Jesus died. So it's supposed to close in silence with a loud bang, like the rock is rolling over the tomb, and then you leave in darkness. Now, we won't do the darkness thing because we don't want anybody getting hurt, but you get the idea. You know, so it's a very solemn type, type of service. I encourage you to come to that if you're able to do so. And then also, we will be having a sunrise service on Easter morning at Cowan Creek Pavilion at 7 o'clock. So if it's cold like today, we're still going to have it, all right? <laughs> so if you'd like to come, come prepared. That's all, I can, that's all I can say. If you're a guest, we'd love to know about your visit today. We have the connection card. We'd like for you to fill that out. And then we also have a little gift for you at the Welcome Center. If you have prayer concerns, I have had some that have sent in updates or answers to prayer that you've listed or you sent. Please continue to do that. That gives us a really good indi indication of what God's doing in our church. You can fill the card out or you can also do that online. Another thing that is helpful for me is if you have somebody that's in the in the community or in the church or in Georgetown and you say would you mind checking on them if you'll give me their name and number that's helpful because if it doesn't say please contact then I don't know where that person lives and they may be out of the area uh, so please as much information as you don't mind filling out that is beneficial if you would like to learn more about the worship place, you've been coming for a while, you say, well, you know, I'd like to have an idea of what we teach or what we're about. A good place to start is Starting Point. And Starting Point is a class that Pastor Terry leads uh, that goes over three sessions and allows you to know about our history, our doctrine, uh, as well as uh, spiritual gifts to give you chances to serve. In Psalm 111 is a great scripture for our call to worship. It says, praise the Lord, I will extol the Lord with all my heart, and the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord, they are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and his precepts are trustworthy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for this gathering. Thank you for all these people that are here. I thank you for the joy that we have, for the laughter that we have, for the smiles, for the handshakes. Uh, just for the joy that we get to have together. Continue to be uh, with our worship team, Lord, as they lead us. May they worship and may we participate with him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. It's a great crowd today. So glad that you came with us and uh, joined us in worship. Let's all stand, please. Turn around to somebody near you. Shake their hand, hug their neck. Tell them how glad you are that they're here as we sing, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to Love and care, and though my heart grows weary, 
with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. As we sing, open up the heavens. Now we waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. The Lord inhabits our praises. That's what he wants us to do is praise him. Just lift his name on high today from our hearts. Light the way. a 
song of resurrection. Hope that fills the weary soul. You have made your home inside. I'm not alone. In the shadow of the valley, you were the lamp. to me. You are my all-encompassing Lord and Jesus Christ and Savior. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You are my strength. Sing it with us now. You are my strength when I am
my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in I read from Psalms 111 earlier, and it continues and says, The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful and just and that we can trust your precepts. We can trust your word to be the guiding factor of our life, to give us instruction, to give us encouragement, to give us hope. They are steadfast. They are upright. They are faithful. And Lord, you provide redemption for us. You have ordained that we would have a covenant with you that would never, ever end. You truly are holy and awesome. Lord, help us to fear you. Help us to have a reverence for you. Help us to respect you. Help us not to assume, Lord, that our life is pleasing in your eyes. Help us to evaluate, to listen, not to be afraid of conviction, but to rejoice that you're bringing us into that fellowship with you. And Lord, while we don't understand, we do know that the word says that to you belong eternal praise. We can't imagine what it's going to be like in heaven, Lord, just to worship you. And so, Lord, we know that when you show up in our worship services, when you touch us through a song, when you encourage us through a word from the pastors, it lifts us spirits. It gives us a sense of, wow, wow, look what God's doing. So, Lord, I thank you that that's what we have to look forward to. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us an opportunity. And at times you give us a little taste of what that's like here. So we ask, would you give a little bit of that today? Would you give us a taste of that? And then as you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So uh, many years ago, I hate to say it that way, but our youngest son, I don't know, there were things going on in his life, and I thought that I needed to talk to him about idols and talk to him about, we can have idols and, and you know, they get in our lives and we, we tend to serve them and love them more than the Lord. And that little boy rolled his eyes at me so big and, he's, and he said to me, mother, he said, I do not have statues in my bedroom that I bow down and say, oh, I worship you, oh statue, you are my God. He's like, really mother? And then he says, can I go play now? And I realized, I realized that that was just a concept that his young brain just did not understand yet. But his brain does now. And so do we, don't we? We understand about idols and having things in our lives that we place before the Lord. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the Lord just, I just have to ask him to humble me because some, there, some things I just don't really want to look at. King David, David in Psalm 24 says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul up to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God our Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O oh God of Jacob. Paul uh, picked out a new song for us, and it's based on this psalm. It's called Give Us Clean Hands, and it's really, it's a prayer about coming to the Lord and th casting aside our idols and asking Him to give us clean hands and a pure heart. Oh, people, that we would be a generation who seek His yes. face. Yes. Amen. Sure. 
find that song convicting yes my uh, soul my spirit goes off in other directions all so often well um pastor terry was supposed to be preaching this morning but uh yesterday he had some uh, severe back pain and so i'm your emergency relief preacher today <laughs> Americans like to have choices. Uh, that's really part of our culture, has been for some time. Uh, we lived in Canada. You go to a grocery store there, and you don't have near so many choices as you do here. Uh, we got all kinds of choices, and that's why there's Coke, Diet Coke, Caffeine-Free Coke, Cherry Coke, Vanilla Coke, Classic Coke, Coke Zero. And according to the Coke website, 120 more varieties of Coke. And so for many Americans, we're used to this multiple choice, this variety that's out there, and I think it also, unfortunately, applies to belief systems and religion. Uh, one example of that is actress Sarah Michelle Gellar, who says, I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe in an idea of God, although it's my own personal ideal. I find most religions interesting, and I've been to every kind of denomination, I've taken bits from everything and customized it. Now, I don't think that's unusual. I don't think this uh, pick-and-choose, mix-and-match approach is limited to celebrities at all. In fact, many who consider themselves followers of Jesus approach Christianity like it was some kind of a buffet where you help yourself to whatever looks good and avoid what appears distasteful. Well, why can't that work? Well, look at Jesus' words this morning in John chapter 6, and we're going to see three reasons why truth can't be multiple choice. The very thing that uh, that actress, as well as many, many other people, talk about, that we can take this and not that, well, not if you believe Jesus. Uh, three reasons from John chapter 6, and these words that Jesus says are very hard to hear. They were very hard to hear when Jesus said them, and we'll see that. And I think they're just as hard, if not more so, Difficult to hear in our culture today as well. So I want to share with you three reasons why truth can't be multiple choice uh, based on what Jesus says here in this passage from the Gospel of John. The first reason is this, because truth is fertilizer or fireworks. Now I'm using different words than Jesus used, but I'll explain here. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols used one ton of ammonium nitrate to destroy the federal building in Oklahoma City. Terrible tragedy, 168 people killed. Uh, that's a chemical fertilizer that was readily available, used to make things grow, but it can also be used to destroy, bring great destruction. I would tell you today the truth of Jesus can be life-giving, or it can be distorted to bring destruction. Look what Jesus says, verse 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. These are stark words here. Shocking. Jesus isn't talking about cannibalism, by the way. And that was a charge that was thrown against the early church when they took communion. But, you know, he, he's not talking about communion either. He's not talking about the Lord's table. He is declaring through this metaphor, through this symbolism, that he's indispensable to true life. That, that he, Jesus, is not an additive to life, make life work better. That Jesus is not an ingredient for the recipe of existence. That he is everything. And you must consume him. You must receive him totally. That vague belief in Jesus is not enough. In fact, the verb tenses in the original language of the words eat and drink, when he says eat the flesh, drink the blood, the verb tenses mean once for all. 
So there's this once for all receiving of Jesus, consuming Jesus. Jesus calls on his people to feast on him completely. Because here he is referring to himself as the bread of life. And it's not just enough to taste that bread or to enjoy the aroma of it. You must consume completely. Having Christian parents or a believing spouse is not enough. Being a, a church attender is not enough. Getting baptized is not what it means to consume Jesus. He must be everything. Those who dabble in Jesus will never be satisfied. So receiving the good news completely is life-giving, but in pieces, it's deadly. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for our sin is the bedrock of our faith. And to change that is deadly. You say, well, I'll take this part, but not that part. Uh, it, 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 because misused truth becomes a lie. Variations result in the loss of God himself. That's what 2 John 9 says. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever you are, whatever you claim, if you don't abide in the teaching of Christ, you don't have God. Misusing Jesus alters the good news from life-giving to life-ending. It turns the rescue rope into a hangman's noose. It changes the antidote into a poison. It transforms helpful fertilizer into devastating fireworks. So that's a reason why we can't treat truth that way. The second reason is because truth is not a cafeteria. Truth can't be multiple choice because it's not a cafeteria. You know, in a cafeteria... You can pick the fried chicken and the chocolate pudding as long as your wife's not looking. <laughs> and you can avoid the things like the grilled tofu if they have that or the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> the truth of Jesus cannot be approached that way. Unlike a cafeteria where you can choose what you like and avoid what you don't, you must accept all that Jesus offers. Verse 55 he said, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. He who eats this bread will live forever. So you see, Jesus is, take it all or nothing. He doesn't bend to fit your lifestyle, your preferences. Over and over, Jesus says some pretty stark things like he is the only bread of life that he is the only door, that he's the only way, that, that no one gets to the Father except through him. Jesus is pretty exclusive. No other religion holds Jesus to be the only bridge to God. No other religion believes what Jesus said about himself. Because if there's only one door, there can't be two ways to get in. If he's the only option, you can't choose some things and not others. So you can't choose God is love, we like that one, and ignore love your enemy. You can't respect the Ten Commandments, but overlook that Jesus sort of reinterprets those commandments and makes them even more severe and, and equates lust with adultery and hate with murder. And you can't find Jesus' life inspiring, but then feel that his virgin birth and his resurrection from the grave is an unnecessary myth. He sang a song this morning at the other campus that no one, it was written by a pastor who does not believe in the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Now, he's part of a, a Christian denomination that's well known, and yet that is, so you, you can't pick and choose. Jesus says it's all or nothing. You can't claim to follow Jesus and yet think nothing about being a very critical person, being joyless, self-centered, materialistic. These are, all, these are all things Jesus condemned. You, you can't add reincarnation or nationalism or astrology or Zen or transcendentalism to Christianity while also claiming Christ. They don't mix. St. Augustine said, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, it's yourself. And so whatever denomination 
someone might be in, if they're picking and choosing like a cafeteria, you end up with a religion that's based on you and not one that's based on Jesus. When it comes to Jesus, selectivity is total failure. It's all or nothing. Pick and choose and you no longer have Jesus. So now there's a third reason that I want to point out to you. And that reason is because all cats are not gray. (laughs) There's a saying that you might have heard, it goes this way, that in the twilight, all cats look gray. And the point of that saying is that when there's not enough light to see, everything looks pretty much the same. In a certain light, then, all belief systems might look plausible. All religions might appear to be identical. Uh, In a certain light, all ways to God might seem equally valid. But it's not so. It's not so. Verse 66. As a result of this, that is what he said about eating and drinking him, his flesh, his blood. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. See, Jesus' words were so offensive that people left him. And these aren't people just hanging out on the fringe. These were people who were called his disciples, who were were followers of Jesus. And then they heard this part about the drinking his blood and eating his flesh, and they said, we're out of here. We don't want this anymore. And they went back to their business, what they were doing. They couldn't handle it. But the 12, and many others, but the 12, they knew better. They knew there's nowhere else to turn. Jesus holds the key to life. The disciples had enough light to see that there's only one truth, and no matter how hard it seemed, there was no second choice. So you see, all ways are not valid As Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And and this is one of the most serious differences between Christianity and other religions, is not everything is as it appears. You study the world's religions and spiritual philosophies, and you see vast differences. To think that they're all the same is at best naive. A lot of people think that, but it's at best naive. Pantheism means that God is in everything. And there are a lot of belief systems that focus around pantheism. If that's what you believe, then one of the results of pantheism taken to its is that you won't kill rats. And so where that belief system prevails, one-third to one-half of all grain is eaten by rats while children starve. Animism is a belief system where there are spirits in the rocks and the trees that have to be appeased. And the result is that in animistic cultures, you will see, usually women, missing fingers. Why? Because in their effort to make the spirits happy, to appease the spirits if they've been offended, these women cut off a digit. One major religion has a hundred names for God, and not one of those names is love. Their God is strict and emotionless. In fact, it's considered blasphemy to refer to that God as Father. So you take any religion from atheism to Zoroastrianism, and Jesus is unique. He offers abundant life now and eternal life to come. He calls God Father. He says that every single one of us is valued and loved by God, made in God's image. And Jesus claims to be the only way to the Father. All cats are not gray. There's ways that seem right, but in the end are death. And so these are three reasons why truth cannot be multiple choice. And those reasons are based on the claims of Jesus. You see, Jesus never presents himself as one of many options, but as the only option. Jesus doesn't offer himself as a better way, but as the only way. Jesus is very exclusive. And it's not just other religions that get this wrong. It's those who claim to follow Christ who get this wrong, too. There are denominations where certain churches don't believe. They pick and choose. They they violate this, and they're just as lost as those who don't claim to know Christ at all. The context of 
John chapter 6, by the way, is that the crowds were swarming Jesus. They're all over him. I mean, they loved everything he did. He talked like nobody ever talked to them before. And he did miracles. And in fact, in John 6, they were just, they were astounded because what Jesus did was he took a boy's lunch and turned it into enough food and some left over to feed 5,000 people. And they thought this was fantastic. And this was so great, they tried to force him to be their king. And Jesus withdrew, got away. Eventually, he went across the sea. And they found him, though. They found him over there, and they swarmed him again, and they wanted more miracles. They begged him to do something miraculous. And Jesus said, you just want bread that fills your belly. You just want me to do tricks for you and satisfy your temporal needs right now. But I tell you, I'm the bread of life. And he said this, the one who feeds on me will live. And as a result, many followers turned away and didn't follow him again. You see, there's a vast difference between being a consumer and being consumed. You can be a consumer of Christ. That's not what he wants. Or you can be consumed by Christ. You can consume him. Now, we live in a consumer society, if you didn't know that. In fact, uh, the binge toward consumerism became most noticeable after World War II. When the war is over and, and the, the baby boom began, you remember that? And, and then, uh, you know, we had a lot more stuff. And ever since then, as one writer put it, our culture has been, quote, molding the ordinary person into a consumer with an unquenchable thirst for its wonderful stuff. We have a lot of wonderful stuff. And our society like to make us consumers of that stuff. And the problem with consumerism is that, you know, we're shopping for the best deal. You know, we want Amazon to get it to our doorstep today. And, and we can afford to be selective. We can look for that best deal. We can wait for the sale. We, we have all kinds of choices. And we can, we can even afford to be wasteful. But to be consumed is different. To be consumed is to be completely absorbed. You know, if you're a consumer of relationships, you say, well, I'll take you on your good days, but not those bad ones. I'll take you as long as you look good, but when you don't look good anymore, I'm going to consume somebody else. But if you're in a consuming relationship, you say, I'll take you for better or worse, richer or poor, in sickness and health, you and only you. That's a consuming relationship. Being a consumer of Jesus fails. To truly follow Jesus, I must be consumed with him completely. He comes before everything and everyone, above your family and your flag, above your safety and your success, above your passions and your possessions. And the call of Jesus goes out to you. In fact, it's going out to you today. Now, we're going to close this service with a song and as we sing that song i'm going to invite you if you have not put your trust in christ or you're unsure of what your status is that you come and speak with me or someone else but we're going to quote that was your cue to get up <laughs> it couldn't have been any clearer i have to get a sign And we're going to sing that song and as we do i invite you to come and meet me here at the front and just speak with i have me pray with you you see, I would urge you that don't pick and choose. Feed on him and live. It's all or nothing. It's when you hear that, you always have a decision to make. Realize God is, is calling you to make a decision today. And, and, and will you turn away, as some of those people did who heard Jesus all those many years ago, will you turn away and say, well, that's too much for me. That's too demanding. That's too intense. That's too costly. Or will you respond and believe and give yourself to the one who is the truth? The one who said, take all of me and you will live and no one will ever snatch you out of my hand. Thanks be to God. Would you stand please with me? Just
benediction now. Now to the one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Sing it. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates.
bless you. Have a great week. Amen.